10. T'Challa Star-Lord. Have you ever seen the MCU's What If animated series? It is honestly really fun and it has a great art style as well. But just like in the comics, it's the fun possible scenarios of What If that are the star. One of the better, if not weirder episodes revolves around a universe where instead of Peter Quill, it was Prince T'Challa of Wakanda who was abducted by the Ravagers all the way back in the day. T'Challa, as the new Star-Lord, convinced the Ravagers to become a Robin Hood-like group who steal from the rich and give to the less fortunate. Under his leadership, they became icons and they saved a lot of people, recruited and persuaded lots of heroes and villains to join the Ravagers, one of which even being Thanos. T'Challa heard of the orb on Morag, the one from the beginning of Guardians of the Galaxy, and he goes to retrieve it, being stopped by Korath the Pursuer, just like Peter was. But unlike Peter though, Korath actually recognized T'Challa as Star-Lord and he joined up as well. He saved Peter Quill from Ego, saved Drax's family, got Nebula and Thanos to reconnect, and even stole a device from the Collector that could terraform ecosystems and save entire planets from starvation caused by overpopulation. That thing Thanos was trying to fix in the Avengers movies. He eventually joins the Guardians of the Multiverse to fight the insanely powered Ultron. It's pretty great. Number 9. Miles Morales becomes Wolverine. In this what if, we don't really get an explanation as to why, but instead of being his normal self, Miles Morales in this world is instead a mutant with the same abilities as Wolverine, and when he is younger he is abducted alongside other children by Weapon X who turn him into the adamantium skeleton super weapon just like the alternate Wolverine, because of course that's what happens. Fast forward a few years though. Now, in this world, sentinels are being used to hunt down mutants by S.H.I.E.L.D. And after Miles takes out like three of them, S.H.I.E.L.D. sends this super cool looking warrior wielding an adamantium katana to take him out. This awesome S.H.I.E.L.D. warrior turns out to be Miles' father. And once he discovers this Wolverine mutant is his son, he turns on S.H.I.E.L.D. So, obviously they send another assassin. Miles' uncle Aaron, who seems to be doomed to be bad no matter what because, you know, that's just how it goes. He is this world's version of Sabretooth. Miles' father defends his son to his dying breath until Miles jumps in to beat Sabretooth to a pulp and almost ends him too before his father convinces him to stop and to instead be a hero. And then the X-Men show up to recruit Miles, led by a professor who is Genki Lee, the original Miles' best friend for some reason. Yeah, I don't know, but this story is wild. You should check it out. Number eight, Wolverunisher. On the topic of Wolverine, what about the what if where Wolverine became a kind of Punisher? In this story, we were in 1920s Canada, following a Wolverine who doesn't seem to actually have claws, or if he does, he barely uses them. He does seem to have his healing factor and senses though. Whatever his powers are, he is still himself because we find out he has had a son with a lady who um works at a bar. He is forced to take responsibility for them and makes friends with the barkeep, but that all comes to an end when they are all brought to an end thanks to a fire caused by a man named Scarface who fled to Chicago. Obviously, Logan isn't going to let that go. He tracks down the villain and with the help of one Matteo de Prigia, and all while wearing a skull and crossbones flag on his chest and wielding firearms and basically never popping his claws, he actually takes his revenge on Scarface and it, it's great. I mean, he looks totally amazing in this story, but it's also an incredibly weird twist on a version of Punisher and a version of Wolverine. Also, it's a little more disappointing than I expected it to be. Number seven, Wolverine Lord of the Vampires. What if volume two, number 24, takes the story of Uncanny X-Men number 159, in which Dracula has drunk just enough from Storm to get in control of her mind. But instead, in What If, he drinks enough to completely turn her into a member of the undead. As an evil, unstoppable vampire, Storm turns all the other X-Men into vampires as well. But thanks to Wolverine's healing factor and berserker powers, he is able to resist the complete mind control of Dracula and beheads the Vampire King. Now, after either turning or delifing all almost all the other heroes and having the US turned into a quarantine zone, the only hero left to stop Wolverine, Vampire Lord, has found his perfect vessel after traveling the astral plane. Doctor Strange's spirit and Frank Castle, the Punisher, kind of, sort of, merged together and being the most accomplished vampire hunter, Frank dispatches quite a few vamps before Kitty Pride attempts to split the two before being separated from her head. This, of all things, snaps Wolverine out of it and he gets to the dark hole and destroys himself and every single other vampire. Wow, what a roller coaster of emotion. Number six. Thaddeus Hulk Ross. So it turns out that if Thaddeus Thunderbolt Ross were the one to save Rick Jones from the Gamma Bomb and become irradiated and become the Hulk, he wouldn't last very long at all. That's what happens in What If General Ross had become the Hulk. 
Gamma affects everyone differently, as the Watcher tells us, and for the general, he immediately turns into a Hulk, but retained his intelligence only without being able to properly speak or really handle the situations he was now in properly. For example, he accidentally completely squashed Rick Jones. He stopped Igor, the Russian spy who caused the Gamma explosion, but also caused untold damage in the process. And after fighting the military, it turns out he threw a tank that traveled all the way to the house of Betty Ross, daughter. The tank he threw crushed the house with Betty inside. He went to find her as she would be the only one who's able to actually help him in this situation that he's in, and instead all he found was the result of what he had done and a weeping Bruce Banner. Ross transforms back into his regular form, which allows Bruce to pull out a weapon and end the life of this now tormented Ross. I'm sorry, I know this didn't end on a particularly happy note. This is, I guess, the more depressing story than that Spider Man one. Number five. What if Ghost Rider was a baby? I know we keep pulling from this one, but that damn what if the Watcher was a stand-up comedian, what if comic, it's, it's honestly the gift that just keeps on giving. There is a full page devoted to the question of what if the Ghost Rider had possessed someone else Someone other than Johnny Blaze. And of course, instead of finding some other able bodied man or woman, a cigarette smoking, leather vest wearing watcher shows us the spirit of vengeance inhabiting the body of an elderly woman in a wheelchair demanding warm milk, a rollerblade wearing woman vowing to bring an end to disco, and an infant in a stroller. A big headed goo goo gaga who will hunt for vengeance after it finds someone to change its diaper. And just to make it 10 times better, this wee bab is wielding a cat. Swinging around its head as it zooms around its hellfire stroller. I can't make this up. I honestly can't. Number four, Magneto in cyberspace. From one utterly bonkers story to another. At least this one's a bit better. In What If X-Men, we have a really strange alternate world. A post-apocalyptic one, but one that's gone completely digital. And humanity's mutations lie in their internet connection rather than in their DNA. With mutants having the EXE gene instead of the X gene. This issue follows two very different versions of Domino and Cable as they are tasked by Xavier to rescue Eric aka Magneto, a digital entrepreneur taken hostage. Except he isn't a good guy. Surprise. No, he is actually masterminding a whole digital coup. But using his powers and Domino, Xavier connects to Eric, takes over his body and mind, and erases him from cyber existence. At least that's what I gathered when I was reading it. I really have no idea what the heck is happening here. It's really strange, but you should definitely check it out. Number three, six armed Spider Man. In the legit continuity, Spider Man undergoes an experiment to try and get rid of his spider abilities. Instead, he gains two extra sets of arms. Great success! In the original universe, he uses a serum with the blood of the living vampire Morbius to revert back to his normal self. But in What If number 42, Morbius is eaten by sharks, because of course he is. And Spider-Man is doomed to retain his eight limbs. Ultimately, this Spider-Man learns that maybe these limbs are not a curse, but actually give him a buff in his agility and attack power. He is even able to save Gwen Stacy from her demise. Looks like someone rolled a natural 20. He was so popular that he went on to actually go on to be included in a few multiversal spider events. So honestly, a great, if not weird, version of Spider-Man. Number two, new Fantastic Four. What If This Was The Fantastic Four is a comic that was a tribute to illustrator Mike Wierango, who unexpectedly passed away while working on this story. And even if that wasn't the case, it is still one of my favorite What Ifs. The original Fantastic Four is brought to an end by the Skrull agent Delilah, and in their place, a team of four heroes step up to the plate, if not with a bit of reluctance. Spider-Man, Wolverine, The Incredible Hulk, and Ghost Rider. Ben Grimm was the only member of the original team who survived, and at their funeral, he gave this new team his blessing while he went off to raise Franklin Richards. This new team came under attack from cosmic beings who seemed to sense the Earth losing one of its major teams. But this was all orchestrated by Doctor Doom, as I'm sure no one is surprised by. Thanks to Ghost Rider's inclusion on the team though, Mephisto uses Doom and possesses him, and creates a team of the hero's villains who are power boosted with infernal magic. So Venom, Abomination, Sabretooth, and Sandman. This fearsome four, as they call themselves, do battle with the new team eventually being defeated, revealing the Mephisto possessed Doom who almost destroys the team until he is stopped by a combined effort of the citizens of New York and Spider-Man utilizing the disruptor that finish off the Fantastic Four to save the people of New York, Doctor Doom, and the day. Nice. Number one, Thanos. 
Okay, so bear with me here. In the What If Infinity Dark Reign story, Norman Osborn, after becoming the director of Hammer and the Dark Avengers, figures out how to get his hands on the Infinity Gauntlet, defeating the Illuminati and all the heroes and becoming the Goblin King. Using the gauntlet, he creates a world completely under his tyrannical rule, and he teleports his horrible father from the past to show him the things he has done in an attempt to get his father's love and admiration, something he never had and still doesn't. Honestly, his father begins to bash him for becoming a tyrannical ruler, which is a little sadder given the fact that it was his fault Norman even turned out this way in the first place. Teleporting them both back to the Dark Avengers base, the entire team has been destroyed. As Norman is trying to figure out exactly what has happened here, it's revealed that Thanos is the one who's done it, and he's shown up to collect the gauntlet. Thanos is Incredibly awesome, but unfortunately not even the Mad Titan is a match for someone wielding the Infinity Gauntlet And he is dispatched, but not before he tells Norman that he is trying to get the love of someone who will never give it to him After Thanos is gone Norman's father being forced by the Infinity Stones begins to tell Norman how great he is And Norman loses his mind wiping his father from all existence all time and all space Which was dumb because now Norman Osborn's existence is a paradox and he and this world he created fade into emptiness so so yes, Thanos is the hero here in a very weird roundabout way. Number 10, Johnny becomes a living robot. We have talked about 1977's What If number 6. It's the one where the Fantastic Four have different powers. You know, where Reed becomes a brain and Ben Grimm gains dragon wings. That one. Sue Storm gets the most boring power, just taking on Reed Richards' stretching ability, but Johnny got a power that doesn't really make sense to me. Growing extra limbs or losing your body, minus your brain, and being human rubber doesn't really make sense either, but how the cosmic rays converted Johnny into a mechanical living robot with metal parts that calls himself Mandroid, I'll never know. Johnny is now forever a living robot and can control other forms of technology. He's also eternally a metal version of himself which is honestly pretty good for a guy who loves his looks, because they'll never change. He's still a hothead though, so there's that. Number 9, WW2 Space Nick Fury. 1979's What If Number 14 gives us a very different approach to history. Instead of World War II being fought in Europe, it is instead fought in space. In this alternate timeline, we discover interstellar travel much earlier in our history. And as such, the World War II we fight is more like Space Sector War, between Sector Alpha and Sector Beta in space. Don't ask me to define where those sectors are, I cannot. As this is still set at the same general time as regular WW2, some of the same characters are going to be involved, including the original Nick Fury and his Howling Commandos. New high-tech weaponry, fishbowl helmets, and aliens. It's a good bit of fun. We learn in the story that Admiral Von Strucker is actually working with the alien Axis powers to create a master race. So it seems we can master interstellar travel, but we still can't just accept each other's differences yet. Who put some reality in my comic book? Number 8, Thor, Herald of Galactus. Yes, the terrifying thought of someone as powerful as Thor becoming the Herald of Galactus is a strange thought, if only because it's so troubling. In this what if, Thor beats the ever-living heck out of the female Silver Surfer, who is the Herald of Galactus as he attacks Asgard, after she mortally wounds Sif. Seeing just how powerful Thor and his hammer are, Galactus stops the fight and offers Thor a place as his herald. Now, Thor initially says no, as we'd expect, and goes to keep fighting Galactus, but when the big purple dude points out that Asgard is in pretty bad shape, Thor takes one look, drops his hammer, and accepts. Just like that. Now, Thor makes a pretty awesome looking herald. Even in the odd style of the comic, choosing the most fearsome and brutal worlds to feed to the world eater, and sparing the weaker innocent worlds, again, as we'd expect. When Thor hears of Asgard being ruled over by Loki though, who de-lifed Odin and left Asgard in ruins, he takes some time from heralding to deal with his brother. Rediscovering his hammer and wielding it alongside the power cosmic, Thor becomes extremely powerful. Freeing his imprisoned friends and giving up Asgard for Galactus to feast upon, he destroys Loki and his frost giants and remains as the Herald of Galactus, saving innocent worlds from his destruction. Awesome. Number 7. What if Aunt May died instead of Uncle Ben? Ready to be depressed? Great. 
Because in this what if story, we are given a first hand look at what happens to Peter if Aunt May was the one to lose her life instead of Uncle Ben. Peter, fueled by rage, goes after her killer and ends his life. But unexpectedly, Uncle Ben shows up and he takes the fall for Peter, going to jail. Now, Peter is going through life with no real moral center to help guide him, and he hates the idea of being Spider-Man. He becomes a bit of a troubled kid. He goes to juvenile prison, escapes, lives on the street, and when he is almost at his breaking point, he tries to break Uncle Ben out of prison. Instead of going with him though, Uncle Ben convinces Peter to make Aunt May proud. Peter takes it to heart. He fixes his life. He meets Mary Jane. He focuses on school, being a hero when the world really needs him, and eventually, Ben gets out of prison on good behavior. And that's when we finally get the power and responsibility speech, which leads to Peter becoming Spider-Man more permanently. And with Uncle Ben as a Spider-Man version of Bruce Wayne's Alfred, he goes on to become the hero New York deserves. Number six, Spider-Man Punisher. On Earth 71928, or the what if Peter Parker became the Punisher story, Peter's life remained pretty much the same as Earth 616 Peter. That is, until Uncle Ben's life was drawn to a close and in response, Peter dispatched the robber who did the deed. In a very Punisher-like decision, Peter decided to deal with crime from this point on by any means necessary. Meaning, he started de-lifing criminals. Peter tried to avoid this at first, trying to go his normal route, but since criminals are criminals, and they always come back, and he knows how much easier of a solution it is to just take them out Punisher style, he went full force into that lifestyle. The easy solution, in my opinion, is not the heroic solution, but hey, that's how it goes. He carried the blam blam that took out Uncle Ben's life, as well as other weaponry and multiple different types of ammunition. His suit also took a skull logo instead of the traditional spider logo. Not because they want him to look like the Punisher, but due to the fact that the spider that gave him his powers was a noble false widow, which has a cephalothorax that looks like a skull. That's the reason. Not because the Punisher. Stop. Stop, he's not the Punisher, stop. Number five, Daredevil is bullied and just gives up. One day, when fighting against Electro with Spider-Man, Daredevil is unaffected by a blinding flare set off right in front of his face by Electro. This kind of clues in Electro to the idea that maybe this Daredevil guy is already blind. And when Electro and Spider-Man ask Daredevil what color Electro's costume is, seals the deal. Electro lets the whole world know by leaking this info to the Daily Bugle after Spider-Man actually sort of makes fun of him, saying it makes sense why he chose that yellow costume because he couldn't see how bad it was, you know? Villains begin to take advantage of the massive weakness for Daredevil, and while he is able to hold his own still, he eventually decides to undergo an experimental treatment that restores his sight but removes his super senses. Now powerless, Matt Murdock and Karen Page get married and have a normal life, with Matt becoming the district attorney. Wow, kind of a nice ending there. Number four, Barbarian Hulk. All right, this one requires a bit of unpacking. So. In issue 23 of What If, the Incredible Hulk has fallen in love with a woman named Jarella, a green-skinned queen from the subatomic world of Kai, who was brought back to our world when the Hulk was unshrunk. In regular continuity, she is laid to rest after sacrificing herself to save a boy from some rubble during a Hulk battle. But in this story, she lives, and the Hulk and Jarella are shrunk again so they can go and live happily ever after, on the subatomic level in the Kingdom of Kai. Now, Kai, for some reason, is very medieval slash Roman slash ancient in general, and Hulk, who now possesses his full intelligence, becomes king alongside Jarilla. Soon, a dark plot by some dark gods and their dark minions rears its ugly head, and Hulk, alongside a group of other subatomic barbaric heroes, goes to thwart them, facing off against a second savage Hulk that seems to have just been dispatched in like two comic panels. And that's where it ends. I'm assuming Hulk just stays subatomic and never returns to Earth, living as a microscopic barbarian for the rest of his life. Please check out this story. Number three, Iron Man the Traitor? In one of the first ever what ifs, when Iron Man is famously captured and forced to create weapons, he still creates the Iron Man armor. But the change comes when instead of booting up and busting his way out of there, he is held captive. The boot up sequence takes too long, and Jensen's sacrifice doesn't buy him enough time. Tony is found and restrained before he can do anything. 
Now that he has been found and this new weapon, the Iron Man armor, is discovered, the leader of the terror organization, Chen Lu, plants a device in the arc reactor that keeps Tony alive that allows him to shut it off remotely if Tony doesn't do what they say. And he implants a communication device in Tony's skull so that Chen Lu can spy on and control Tony. Then he lets him be discovered and he goes back to being like normal Tony Stark. But thanks to the fact that he can now control Tony, he forces him to become a hero like he would have anyways, gain the trust of the superhero community, and then learn secrets pertaining to S.H.I.E.L.D. But it's once Tony is ordered to dispatch Reed Richards and goes to complete the mission that it's revealed that Tony had been recording a tape by speaking incredibly slowly and he sent that tape to Reed who, when he played it at a faster speed, learned of the situation Iron Man was in. So once their fight began, Iron Man eventually got um, incapacitated by Reed who actually helped him remove the device inside Tony's heart giving Tony the chance to get his revenge. It's kind of a weird way of doing that. Number 2. Spider Actor A second Spider-Man what if on this list? <laughs> oh my. In this what if number 19, Peter Parker makes the simple decision of stopping the robber who would go on to take Uncle Ben's life. That simple act robs Peter of the lesson of the responsibility of having great power, and instead he turns to a life in the public eye. Now, as an actor, Peter turns his focus towards making films and protecting his reputation almost at any cost. He becomes the publicist for both the Avengers and the Fantastic Four as well as Daredevil. All while still retaining his Spider-Man persona. He even gets a cool cape for a little bit. It, well, it wasn't really that cool. When JJ exposes him to the public though, we see a bit more of an edge to this Spider-Man. When he threatens him and eventually ends his career. Which comes back to bite him when Jonah forms the Sinister Six, including himself. It is only after Daredevil jumps in to save Peter and fight the villains that Peter does actually learn that old power and responsibility thing. But man, Peter's a bit of a snob this way, I don't like it. Number one, Fantastic Five. I, I mean, four, five, four. Uh. In the very first What If comic, the question that is posed is pretty simple. What if instead of rejecting Spider-Man, the Fantastic Four instead let Spider-Man join? Marvel's most popular family adopting Marvel's favorite hero? A match made in heaven. The Fantastic Five go on to fight crime and supervillains. That is, until the battle with Namor the Submariner. In this alternate reality, at the end of this battle, Sue Storm feels kind of cast to the wayside, with more focus being put upon Peter and the other members of the team. And she leaves with Namor and becomes his bride. It completely stops the marriage of Reed and Sue from ever happening, which is just a weird, unnatural world to see. We don't like it. But life goes on, and the new Fantastic Four featuring Spider Man go on with their lives. But now we don't get a Franklin or a Valeria Richards, and I mean, they're pretty important now, so. I don't know, let me know in the comments what other fallout you think would happen with Sue Storm being replaced by Spider Man on the Fantastic Four. It's seriously an interesting question. Number 10. Ice Giant Thor. A perfect what if tale. It's almost surprising it wasn't done before this point. In What If Thor in 2018, we get the story of what if Thor was raised by Frost Giants. Laufey, the king of the Frost Giants, defeats Odin in their battle so long, long ago. And just as Odin took the infant Loki, Laufey takes the kid Thor and raises him as his own. Loki is obviously here too. And like usual, they form a pretty tight bond as adoptive brothers. Unfortunately, due to Thor's strength and skill in battle, not to mention his fondness for summoning the power of lightning, he is praised among the frost giants and by Laufey himself, who begins to completely forget Loki, his actual true son. Instead, Loki finds the captured Freya in the dungeons and she teaches him how to use magic. Loki eventually busts her out of prison and together they attempt to escape to Midgard. They go to the ruins of Asgard and attempt to repair the Rainbow Bridge until Thor and Laufey show up. Loki ends the life of his father while Thor unknowingly ends his mother with a blast from his giant ice hammer, Ice Crusher. Thor almost takes out his brother as well but at the last minute he lets him go. We don't know what happens next, only that Loki went to Midgard, had kids and a family and apparently became a hero. It ends on a rather sweet note though. Number 9. Man Spider Ok, so in this story everything that happens to Spider-Man is exactly the same. Oh, sorry, I left out the extremely important detail that in What If Number 8 in 1978, this isn't Peter Parker, it's Webster Weaver, an anthropomorphized spider in a world of other animal people. Oh yes, and he gets bit by a radioactive human giving this spider the proportional powers of a human. Apart from that, and the villains being hilarious alternate versions like Marvin the Hunter, Culture Vulture, Rude Rhino, the Green Gobbler, King Pig, 
Octodoctopus, and Leaping Lizard. Everything is just the same as it always is. Until one day, Ray's the Bug Spray Baron threatened to destroy the Ozone unless he was given one trillion dollars. Turns out Ray's is the guy who defeated Webster's Uncle Ben. I mean, Uncle Bug. Man Spider saves the day, Ray's is destroyed, and he swings back home to Aunt Mayfly. Okay, yes, it's totally different, but a lot of story beats are still the same, so there's that. Number eight, Mustang. What if 114 posed us the question, what if heroes didn't leave the battle world? The answer? They make babies! While there are a few super kids in this story, the one I found to be the strangest was Mustang. Mustang is Clint Barton Jr. And I bet you'll never guess who his father is. His mother, on the other hand, again, not surprising if you just look at him, is Jennifer Walters, the She-Hulk. So, with these two avenging parents, that leaves Mustang with a super strength that isn't quite on She-Hulk's level, and an affinity for using bows. I'm sorry, it's just an odd combo to me. He's a bit taller than almost everyone else too, which makes sense. So I'm guessing this gives him the ability to use bigger bows with much higher tensile strength? So he can shoot bigger arrows? He can fire them much faster? Look, I'm not saying these powers aren't helpful or cool. I mean, super strength is a classic. They're just odd when they're put together. Also, why Mustang? Number seven, Civil War Captain America. Honestly, I'm kind of a fan of this what if story, but it does have some strange moments and twists on characters you might not expect. For example, the story starts out with our Steve Rogers and Bucky Barnes time displaced to the Civil War era. Bucky is the commander of the regiment and he is not a good guy. Apart from being an unhealthy amount of racist, he has quite the lack of moral compass. Our Steve obviously starts out as his scrawny and less than impressive self, but with a heart that shines through as strong and good. After sustaining injuries from not following his commander's orders, he is recovering in a nearby Union camp tended to by a private Wilson taken in by the Shawnee at a young age. Sensing the goodness in his heart, Wilson bestows a kind of eagle animal spirit on Mr. Rogers that makes you on the outside whatever you are on the inside. And this happens just as Barnes stumbles upon their location. The power of the ritual blasts Barnes away, and when we see his face, he has become the White Skull. Which, I mean, you could, you could just call him Skull, because skulls are white, you know, but... Whatever. And Steve has become a mystical super soldier, wielding a shield and sporting a headdress. He goes on to save presidents and leaves a lasting legacy of Captain and General Americas that continues all the way to the modern day. It's pretty sweet. Number six, Fantastic Four as cosmonauts. Let's explore the what if story that begs the question of what if the Fantastic Four were Russian? Well, for starters, their name is different. In fact, they're pretty much all different. Now, the UFFF, or the Ultimate Federalist Freedom Fighters, the team is made up of Rudian Richards, the commie Red Richards, who instead of stretching can just pop off his limbs and send them out over long distances, which is way more alarming. Natalia Romanova, the 616 Black Widow, who is now Widow Maker and can control electromagnetic energy. Pyotr Rasputin, who is still just Colossus and has all those powers except his body and mind are deteriorating over time. And lastly, Piotr's sister, Ileana Rasputina, who seems to have the powers of Sue Storm, but we only ever see her go invisible, which is way less cool than the 616 continuity. After the demise of Stalin, the team is put under KGB control, and Rudd Richards, easily the strangest member of the team, is not having it. Especially after he accidentally ends the life of Giant Man. Widowmaker makes widows of the wives of the leaders of the KGB, and the superhero teams go on to fight for freedom and equality. But that isn't how you thought it would go. I didn't. Number five, Ghost Rider. Honestly, not even sure how this makes sense, but in this What If comic, Marvel, the comic company, exists as a comic book company that writes all the same comics it normally would, including comic books about Ghost Rider Robbie Reyes, who also happens to be an intern at Marvel in this story, but is also still Ghost Rider. Look, I never said that these things had to make sense, okay? What is honestly even weirder is that the studios of Marvel are being visited by this Nordic death metal band called Hassenwald from Latveria, who have fun clubs all over the world, including in Wakanda. Oh, and they also have been accused of witchcraft, church burning, and eating people. It turns out to all be true, as while they are visiting Marvel, they sacrifice the donkey who runs the printing press and use its blood to create 
possessed Ghost Rider comics that turn the world into a hellscape, making them the ultimate rulers of it using the power of the old gods to do so. Now, Robbie Reyes is trapped in this hellscape world where Hassenwald has dispatched the Marvel Universe and he needs to save it. Number 4. Limo Man In one of those many crazy panels in number 34 of What If, Remember that one where the watcher is a comedian? We get to see a single panel that asks the question, what if Tony Stark owned an auto company instead of a weapons company? Now, whoever was writing this panel was absolutely cooking with gas. They knew what was up. Basically, if that was the case, then the world would get to interact with Limo Man. A hero with a license plate, belt, tire pauldrons, with rear view mirror horns, headlights on his chest, and a sweet pair of rollerblades. He is honestly the least cool Transformer you have ever seen. He does look like he's made up of a luxury car though, so I guess that gives him some kind of arbitrary style points. Right? At least the robber he seems to be facing seems to be a little bit worried. Number three. Doom! Sorry. <laughs> what would a good guy version of one of the strongest, most quotable, and most villainous villains in the pages of Marvel look like? Well, in issue 22 of What If, we get to see just that. When the Victor Von Doom of this universe discovers Reed Richards looking over his experiment notes, uninvited, he instead invites Reed to come help him out, which I think a true scientist would do. With Reed's help, he's able to contact his mother in the afterlife and learns of his royal blood. He trains in the advanced technology and mystical arts of an order of monks in Tibet and in the darkest places of sorcery, and is granted instead of his classic armor, this really sweet golden armor evocative of knights. I think he looks pretty cool, but you know, that's just me. He uses his knowledge to free his mother's soul from the realm of Mephisto, and uses his technology and sorcery to free his kingdom from an oppressive ruler. And all goes really well, until Mephisto comes back demanding the soul of his lover Valeria in exchange for the freedom of his people. Then he battles Mephisto once every year to try and save his love. It was almost a happy ending. Number two, Dazzler, Herald of Galactus. Dazzler is already weird without being in a what if story. She's a collab between Marvel and a record label. That's all I have to say. Okay, so Dazzler's power is that she can convert sound into light. Pretty good for a disco singer. And especially so since she uses this power to literally dazzle people at her concerts. In What If number 33 though, Dazzler is chosen as the new Herald of Galactus, being the only being who could retrieve the old Herald who hid in a black hole, which she does. And then, in the alternate timeline, Galactus sends him back into the black hole as a punishment? I don't know, okay? She was given a huge boost with the power cosmic, and for some reason, even with her new boosted up power, she decides to keep the disco ball rollerblades. She's actually really torn up about having to leave her world, but she vows to at least do good by not letting Galactus eat inhabited planets, which Galactus actually obliges because, well, it seems like he's got the hots for Dazzler, or whatever the world eating equivalent of the hots is. There is a whole conflict with an armada, and then Galactus releases her to go back to Earth, which has been the victim of an apocalypse in her absence. And she goes back to him yet again as some kind of weird, twisted, intergalactic love story. I don't know, it's really strange. Number one, Jane Foster becomes Thor. But Adam, this happens in the 616 continuity. Yes. But this one's a little bit different. In this what if story, number 10 actually, it is Jane Foster who first picks up the hammer Mjolnir, not Donald Blake. In this story, Jane accompanies Dr. Blake on his trip to Norway, and when he drops his cane into a ravine, she goes down there to get it for him instead. Striking the stick, she becomes Thordis. Yes, Thordis. Unlike the modern interpretation, a female wielding Mjolnir gets an entirely new name. Wielding the power of Thor, Thordis fights off the Saturn rock people, and then turns the cane that she seems to have stolen from Donald Blake, leaving him helpless without a cane, into a hairbrush to better fit in with her feminine alter ego, because men don't use hairbrushes apparently. She has pretty much the same adventures as Thor. She's rejected by Odin and Sif gets with Donald Blake, until the events of Ragnarok when Odin decides to give the hammer back to Blake because he can't accept Jane as Thor. And then as thanks, he turns Jane into a different god and then marries her? Kinda gross, kinda really strange, kind of uncomfortable. Luckily, it's only a story that comes from the question, what if? 